Good morning and a very warm welcome to this IFG Net Zero Conference. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the Director of the Institute. We're delighted to have put together this day of talks on this important subject. We set out our own views on, uh, on how the UK can reach net zero last September, commented on the difficulties in putting together such a plan, and we're going to say an awful lot more about this in the run-up to the COP26 summit in November. Over the course of today, we're going to look at the challenges ahead for all countries as they reduce their emissions or try to, getting the public on board, getting the delivery of this right, working out how to pay for it, and looking at what the UK in particular needs to do to succeed as the host of this conference. We've got a slate of great speakers from the UK, Ireland, Germany, France, Singapore, joining us today. The agenda for the whole day is on our website. You can take a look at that. And we're going to be hearing about the UK's net zero plans from Kwasi Kwarteng, the business secretary, tomorrow morning. So I'd very much like to thank our sponsors for today, the Association of British Insurers, the Association for Project Management, Imperial College London, the Transition to Zero Pollution Initiative, and Noble Nordisk. Kick things off, I'm really delighted to be joined by Amber Rudd. She was a minister from 2014 to 2019, rising up to become Home Secretary, and um, most relevant, uh, though I'm sure she will draw on her whole uh, political experience for this, this discussion, but between May 2015 and June 2016, she was the first Conservative climate change minister, during which time she represented the UK at the Paris Climate Change Conference, the last big COP or conference of the parties in the jargon, where the landmark Paris Agreement was reached. Since leaving government, she's continued to take a keen interest in this area. She chairs, um, uh, she's been chairing uh, Equinor UK's International Advisory Group and sitting on the non-profit climate group. Amber has been to talk for about 10 minutes, taking us behind the scenes of the Paris conference, offering her views on what the UK should be doing this year. And I'm then going to ask her some questions before opening it up to questions from you. Please do submit questions. You can use the link at the bottom of the screen. And if you want to tweet along, the hashtag is IFG net zero. Well, with that, a very warm welcome to you, Amber. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Bronwyn. It's a huge pleasure to be here, to be able to take part in this day for the Institute for Government. Um, when David Cameron made me Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change in uh, summer 2015, he said, keep the bills down and get me a deal in Paris. Like most people, I hadn't really focused on the deal in Paris that was looming in front of us, but it became absolutely central to what the government was trying to achieve. And those easy words turned out to be much more difficult. First of all, Paris is now looked back on as a great success, and rightly so. It did achieve um, an enormous amount. There will always be people who say, yes, but it didn't do this, or it didn't do that. But overall, it was the first global agreement of its type. But it wasn't obvious that Paris would be a success when we arrived. 20 to 30,000 people arriving um, it said it was in Paris, but it was in quite a different area of Paris that we go as visitors to, with a home-built conference centre and over 100 countries, 150 in total countries, turning up with their own teams, with little chalets to attend, wondering how this was going to go. So what made it a success? I think that French leadership was absolutely critical. And what they did so well was preparation, so we can now see with hindsight that a certain amount had been agreed, although it wasn't obvious at the time. So everybody felt involved in the decision making, even though the key decisions, the really big players, the Americans and the Chinese, had to a large extent already been agreed. But Laurent Fabius, leading his team from the Foreign Office, um, did a really fantastic job. He set himself up as in a rather grand position as the key negotiator for the UN. Don't forget the COP wherever it's hosted is a UN event where the country where it's hosting is the UN representative. So Laurent Fabius was the UN representative hosting the COP in Paris. The actual uh, buildings around his office that had all been put together on the edge of Paris um, had a kind of series of security layers you had to get through. It was as though you were going to see the emperor of the event. And it was quite effective at making people slightly anxious 
and very keen to get his agreement to the final uh, proposal that they were making. And that there would be a new text of the so-called Paris Agreement in draft that would come out every two or three days. <clears throat> and it would swing from one way to the other quite expertly to please some people and then the others until finally we arrived right at the end at a deal at the end of the second week. And it's this old age saying of needing a final date for a forcing mechanism for people to compromise. I would say the French took it to rather uh, the nth degree. Uh, there was no food, there was no coffee. The last couple of days we were literally working all night. And then when we all gathered in the big amphitheatre auditorium, uh, each country behind its flag with two or three representatives, at the critical moment when uh, Laurent Fabius obviously was there, but so was Francois Hollande and uh, the other sort of main players in the event sitting at the high table, at the critical moment, there was one objector. In the second row, down at the left, on the front, this rather large man stood up and said, I object. And it was Nicaragua who decided they didn't like the capitalist approach to carbon emission reductions. And there was a great huddle at the front. The rumour was that the Pope was on the telephone, can't confirm it. But in the end, Nicaragua put down its objection and the deal went through. So it was a success. It was brilliantly masterminded by the French. It had the shadow of Copenhagen hanging over it. And reflecting on Copenhagen, changes had been made, like when the leaders arrived at the start rather than at the end, and various changes. So what can we learn from that now looking ahead to Glasgow? Preparation, obviously, is critical. I'm just delighted that Alok Sharma, uh, the UK's UN representative for this is now full time on this. It's going to take every inch of his um, effort and time to deliver that and making sure that as much as possible is lined up beforehand. Since Paris, now over five years ago, there have been some magnificent changes to the availability and the price of renewables, the ingenuity of the private sector that make it even more likely that a good deal can, can be agreed at and that carbon emissions are going to fall more potentially dramatically than set out before. We can thank Germany for their huge investment in solar, and we can thank the UK for its huge investment in offshore wind leading the way. And we saw, of course, just this week, the auctions of the Crown licenses, which have been so successful. The other thing that's changed enormously is the strength of feeling of civil society. There was a feeling slightly with Paris over five years ago that this might have been a bit of a niche interest it certainly isn't anymore. Greta, of course, has been absolutely extraordinary in raising general awareness. But just this week in the UK, the Daily Express has joined the good cause and even the sun. So I think that the combination of the fall in the cost of renewables and the availability of so much innovation from the private sector to deliver clean energy and the move of civil society to make it absolutely clear that they want this, make this COP this year more likely to succeed than we might have hoped. We already start this year with 70% of the world's emissions committed to below, uh, to, committed to the Paris Agreement target of, uh, and beyond of net zero by 2050 or 2060. So that's China, the EU and the US. The significance of the US being part of it can't be overstated. It's just fantastic. We now have Biden and Kerry rather than the previous alternative. Um, from that point of view, it has been good for us all that the COP was delayed for a year so we could have a US government that really supports it. Looking ahead to Glasgow, what I hope we will see is building on that uh, emission commitment from other countries. And then some of the really thorny issues addressed, like how do the non-industrialised countries industrialise? How, do uh, how does that consistently take place in a world in which we're trying to uh, reduce carbon emissions? And part of the answer to that is money. Makes it slightly trickier for the UK when they are planning on reducing the DFID budget. But overall, it's an essential part of any COP agreement. I see you've got Pete Betts speaking later on, who is a legend in the negotiating arena, and he will be able to tell us more about what the real key issues are on the negotiating team. Finally, just to observe that from the UK government's point of view, this is a remarkable opportunity. I remember well when Claire Perry, who was former chairman of the COP, uh, brought back as energy minister the opportunity to host the COP in the UK, 
jointly with Italy, we mustn't forget them. And Theresa May seized on it as an opportunity to show what global Britain might mean. And in a world when we've just left the EU, when some countries, some residents are looking at what global Britain actually means, this is a fantastic opportunity for Boris Johnson and his government to be the great convener of probably the most important global meeting that's going to take place, certainly this year and possibly in years to come. A fantastic opportunity and one that I hope the winds are in the right direction for us to deliver on successfully. Thank you. Amber, thank you very much indeed. That's a terrific, succinct, um, sweeping um, account of what uh, what lies ahead and uh, and what happened in Paris, as you said, and what, what made that different from, from Copenhagen. So let me start by asking you this. What counts as success? Uh, well, that's a very good question. In Paris, what counted as success was getting a deal. Can we get everybody to agree on one deal? And there was a certain clarity in that. At the last minute, we made it more ambitious. The UK was very much one of the leaders in what we called the high ambition coalition, trying to make sure that we didn't just aim for a maximum increase in temperature over the century of two degrees, but pushing it back to one and a half degrees. So that was had a certain clarity about it. This year, the strap line for COP is net zero, everyone in. So we hope that there will be increasing commitments to commit to net zero. But here's the thing, Bronwyn, we have to make sure that people show how they're going to do it. I mean, the UK is one of the very few countries that has the legally binding commitment to carbon budgets. And of course, the sixth carbon budget, which has just come out, uh, ratchets it further so that we can make net zero. And in the UK, we can see that achieving net zero is even more ambitious than the previous tasks, the previous aim set out in the Climate Change Act. But we have the legally binding budgets. And I'm sure Chris Stark will be able to, from the Climate Change Committee, will be able to sit, explain how we're doing on those. But I think that trans, good transparency on some of these pledges is what's going to be critical. So, all right, so success is a deal and a deal that, 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 that is something about net zero with as many commitments as possible. But could, could there be a deal where countries give different kinds of commitments? Some are binding, some are not. There definitely will. Um, you know, not every country is going to make it legally binding like we have. And the Paris Climate Change Agreement itself um, you know, people aren't going to invade other countries in order to ensure that they actually deliver. There's a strong element of goodwill. But here's the thing. There is also a strong element of self-interest here because the scale of money that is now being invested into renewable energy is so great and so visible now. I mean, it's always been pretty significant, but the scale of it now is so great that countries will want to look, just as companies want to look and be the country, the countries or the companies that investors who really mind about this, and that is a growing number, will choose. So I think there's an, a strong element of self-interest as well as the element of goodwill that will be part of trying to get a deal. But finally, I would just say, I don't think it's completely clear what the, you know, I, I, if I was asking the COP unit or Alex Sharma, I don't think you'd quite get yet a clear answer of what success looks like. I think that they are still helping to shaping that so we can all be a bit clearer. We know we want more ambition. We know we want uh, more investment in some of the industrial policies that have been so successful, like offshore wind and solar. But quite how they structure that as a formal deal isn't entirely clear to me yet. Mm. And you gave us this fascinating picture where an awful lot of work is done ahead of time, and yet it still comes down to the wire, uh, down to what the leaders agree at the last minute, deprived of food or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, so at this point, um, really just coming around the corner of the year, looking at this in, in, in November, how much of a sense would you expect Alex Sharma to have now about what is possible? Well, I, I would say, first of all, that with the US and the EU uh, yeah. and China, committed to carbon emission reductions to net zero by 50s or 60s, but China's still 2060. Um, I think that, you know, that is a fantastic start. That shows that it can be successful if we can build around that. There is a caveat here, though, that we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, new countries have new variants identified with them in fairly regular intervals, as far as I can see. And so the idea of 20 or 30,000 people coming to Glasgow in November 
uh, getting into little huddles, which is what happens when people are negotiating. Um, I, I'm not sure I can see that taking place. And I know that they are now, the COP unit, thinking about the ramifications of that. And the likely outcome um, at the moment is that a reduced conference will take place where countries will bring much smaller negotiating teams. There is always a slight oddity where some countries, perhaps the smaller ones, often mm. with quite minor emissions, bring enormous teams. Um, they manage to get grants for it. So I think that there will be a uh, an element of efficiency about having smaller teams. Mm. It'll put more pressure on agreeing things beforehand. But I would expect, this may all change, but I would expect that the actual conference will have team leaders, country leaders, and much reduced negotiating teams so that people can conduct it in a socially, socially distanced way, which changes, could, changes could, the Could it actually help? Could it actually help the negotiations to have fewer people there? It might do, but, but one of the effective things of Paris is that businesses were there and civil society were there and cities were there as well. So there was yeah. a great big swelling of um, urgency and demand for getting a deal. And that has a big impact on negotiating teams and country leaders, that this is something that they can't ignore. They can't be the person who says, oh, we're not going to do this. There is a sort of solidarity about it if it's mm. not just the politicians. So I would regret the pre not having the pressure that all those other organisations bring, but they it may nevertheless have to be uh, much reduced in order to accommodate people's concerns about the pandemic. Can you take us into the Chinese position uh, a bit? Because as you said, this is uh, this is absolutely crucial. And yet it's, it's not been clear for some years where China really wanted to place itself in, in this until it began making these commitments. Well, China has been an um, extraordinary leader in nuclear, in uh, wind, and in solar, the scale, it's always the case with China, isn't it? When you find out uh, quite the scale of what they're doing uh, tends to dwarf what we're rather proud of having done ourselves. And, and yet, as the world knows, it has an awful lot of coal as well. And it has an awful lot of coal. So the, you know, we have been trying to take coal off our grid. As we know, there's a little debate going on at the moment in Cumbria, but coal is the big uh, bogeyman of everything to do with climate change. But there is, of course, a lot of coal in China. Um, so I, I'm not sure where China will position itself in terms of um, coal. But at the moment, it has made quite an ambitious commitment, which took everybody by surprise. And that's to be welcomed. If they can actually take coal off the grid and yet deliver net zero emissions by 20 and deliver net zero emissions by 2060 and grow, you see, it's about allowing an economy to grow at the same time. It will be a huge achievement. I do note too about China, like the US, they are the, the big player at the at, at a COP because they're one of the biggest emitters. That China announced just earlier in the week that they'd appointed their own climate change envoy to engage with John Kerry, Alok Sharma, etc. And I saw this announcement, I peered at the screen and I recognised him. He is the same person who we encountered five and a half years ago. And I remember well my many conversations with him. Uh, first of all, he announced that he had been at COP1. So to say he is a veteran <laughs> of these negotiations is an understatement. So I think China is still a, a, an unknown to how they will actually get there. But the scale, of, as I say, in their zero carbon emission investment in electricity over the past few years has been remarkable. Mm. And they are of course also, yeah. so just another thing, probably, they are hosting the biodiversity COP um, yeah. later this year, and there will be an element of negotiation there. They want their biodiversity COP to be successful. Let's hope sufficient people help make it successful because they will then feel a responsibility to make the COP in Glasgow successful as well. There is a kind of uh, international diplomacy going on there that could play to our favour. Yeah, well, there's a lot we could say about the biodiversity one, but not going to go there right now. What do you think the effect of coronavirus has been on, on all this? Uh, on the one hand, it's, it, we've seen people so willing to change their behaviour dramatically um, for common cause, uh, common cause within countries and, and, and in between countries. Uh, and obviously economic activity has been suppressed, which has a short term effect on, on, on helping uh, carbon emissions. Uh, on the other hand, countries are very short of money. And in some important ways, even though there are obvious um, incentives for countries to act 
uh, together. There have all also been incentives for countries to act in their own interest, and they have done that. And I wondered where you, you felt um, coronavirus, both in its direct impact and in its example, what, what it might do for this attempt to get a, a big climate change agreement. Well, I think that it's had a significant impact on what people expect from companies. There's much, many more people are engaged with the corporate world in terms of, you know, are they giving back? I think that, you know, we've all seen the growth of the ESG agenda over the past few years, but it feels to me like coronavirus has accelerated it, that countries, uh, companies are being asked much more what they are doing and being asked to be more transparent on it. Most, a lot of companies um, I know, and we've seen a lot about it in the press, they all need to say what they are doing for COP. They're all being asked to be accountable on it. So I think there's an element of companies being asked to be more accountable, and they're thinking much more about not just their shareholders, but the other broader stakeholders. Mm. From government point of view, I think that even this conservative government is going to step up its intervention. And you're, you're right, there's been you know, a certain amount of vaccine nationalism, but I think that I hope that that will dissipate over the next few months as people feel that there's more enough vaccine to go around and the scale of it grows. So I don't think that will intervene with getting a global agreement. I do think that more will be more emphasis on industrial policy. It's already been seen to be successful in the UK. It's usually not something conservative governments do, but I think we're going to see more of it over the next mm. few months, few years, in order to drive policy in a certain direction. So let's just go into that a bit of, of what we mean by this industrial policy. And it's something that the IFG does does work on. You know, what what should industrial strategy mean? If anything, uh, what do you do to engender growth, particular kinds of growth, and so on? What do you think the UK government should do to um, encourage companies to work in this this area? Mm. Well, it has to share, to create the policy network, the policy framework rather, so that companies have the confidence to invest. And the example I would give of that is offshore wind. I remember very well going to see George Osborne when he was making some fairly severe cuts to the budget, uh, my job as junior minister for energy and climate change under Ed Davey and trying to save um, carbon capture and storage, failed, one billion written off, and trying to save offshore wind, where he insisted that the budgets for the auction come down significantly. And the offshore wind um, associations told me that those budgets were far too low, couldn't possibly reach that auction price and actually deliver profitably. And of course, as you know, those prices just collapsed because of the scale of the industrial policy behind it that went to creating these offshore wind um, um, fields. So. That's the sort of thing I think the government can look at with success, that we created a really effective auction framework which supported this extraordinary industry of offshore wind in which the UK is now, I would say, one of the leaders. So creating those frameworks so that um, innovation can bid in batteries, demand side auctions, there's still a long way we could go. But the government is doing quite a lot of investment. There's already quite a lot that goes through Bay's into innovation. We now have the DARPA initiative, which is coming down as well, which I hope will lead to more investment in science and technology as well, because that is the real difference between now and five or six years ago when, you know, the question was, can we reduce carbon emissions? Can we reduce them by two? And now it's all about, can we speed it up? How fast can we do it? Who's leading on what? Are we being honest with each other? It's a completely different environment. And that's because of the very successful partnership between the private sector and the public sector. Mm. We're talking there in the technologies you mentioned are really about energy generation. What about trying to persuade people to live their lives in a very different way, not travel so much, not travel to work, not travel internationally? I mean, this, this strikes me as something that this government uh, doesn't instinctively want to do, to go about telling people how to live their lives. And yet, in, in your view, um, does any government have to do quite a bit of this to bring about the changes we need for, for net zero? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in a way, we're all sitting around thinking, do we actually want to travel much um, over the next year or so? And we've accommodated our lives to doing speaking events like this and conferences and working events by while sitting at home. So I think there's a natural development taking place there, which will be with us forever, where people may go back to the office in due course, but actually there's so much that can be done from home as COVID has accelerated that change. Mm. 
I think it's difficult for government to try and persuade people to do one thing or the other because people may take a contrary view when they see it that it's in their interest and actually people can be incredibly efficient by doing it they are much more likely to do it in that way. Mm. So you would say in a way that digital broadband is um, is a uh, is a kind of green technology. It, 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 it is a green technology. I mean, the the whole um, evolution of different types of digital technology, the Internet of Things, and being able to manage the grid is a critical part of not only managing our energy consumption, but also of helping non-industrialized countries develop their own energy sources. We, you know, mm -hmm. if we're going to make solar really useful it has to be transported to other places we want our batteries to work more effectively until they do there are different ways of developing hydrogen from when there might have been too much wind in the offshore wind if we can convert that to hydrogen we can make sure that that moves into supply electricity where it's needed so the having really efficient systems between those is going to be critical to successful low carbon future mm. All right, well, um, let's go to some questions now, which are coming in on all kinds of things that we have been um, discussing. Let me take one from David Dury at the beginning, saying it may be legally binding in the UK, but the government has ignored 22 of the 25 recommendations from the CCC by 2020. Um, that's, a, that's a statement, not a question. Um, <laughs> do, you have any, do, 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 um, do you have any comment on the, on the UK's record to date, if you like? Um, I think the UK's record to date has been good, um, but there is obviously more always we can do. The net reductions have been uh, effective. I think that we do need to do, I mean, the, the question or the question or comments about the Committee on Climate Change and the recommendations not being adhered to. Um, I'm not sure which ones they are, but I can say that we took the carbon budget requirements very seriously. And we did meet the first, I think it is three, and I think there's problems with four and five, but the fact that government has a legal commitment to meet them means that they yeah, ultimately they can't be avoided. So it may not please everybody that they're not being exceeded or met sufficiently by using certain types of measurements, but let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. This country is doing well on meeting the carbon reduction emission targets. Mm. Let's go to another one from someone who hasn't given their name, but an interesting point about agriculture in all this and um, asking really, are we, are we going to see a lot of attention on agriculture at the COP26? And the question, question goes on to say, uh, um, you know, in a way, agriculture is, is, a, is a way of saving um, emissions or if you tackle that, it's a way of saving emissions. And in, indeed, it, it's a very good question. What happens to agriculture in the UK uh, as the effects of Brexit? Uh, become apparent, but the question is particularly concerned about those in, in poorer countries um, saying that if there's really a serious at attempt to tackle emissions from agriculture, this could decimate livelihoods and increase food insecurity. And I wonder what you thought of, of, of this, it, which is one of these big issues and, and agriculture is, is, as we can see from trade deals, capable of bringing down all kinds of, of, of deals, whether you thought it was going to have a prominent part in, in this. I think inevitably it will. Um, this isn't just about uh, um, electricity production, which some people sort of misleadingly think so. It is part of uh, agriculture, will be part of it. It'll be part of it because to certain countries, which I'm sure is what your questioner has got in mind, it's absolutely their number one priority. And they need to be able to improve their agricultural yield and they need sources of electricity to help do that and they need finance to do that. And I, I can't emphasize enough the way that at, at Paris and at subsequent COPs, I know this to be the case as well, there is this theme that goes through, which is uh, you Western countries have created this problem. You have you know, used coal, et cetera, and industrialized in a way that has created this crisis. We are now seeking to industrialize. We, and up to that, I would say, improve our agricultural yield as well, create employment, create uh, wage earners much more successfully. So you need to pay for it. Uh, you need to help pay for it so that we can get ourselves out of poverty in a way that doesn't contribute to the carbon budget. And 
this is a very sort of gritty realpolitik discussion that takes place. And the Western countries have to be ready for it. The Americans will know that's part of it. Certainly the UK does and the EU. And it's, it's absolutely critical that if we're going to get a global movement away from um, carbon emissions, there's an understanding that we have to support other countries to increase their yield on agriculture and allow them to um, develop their own middle class, etc. cetera. Mm. Good point. OK, we've got another one from John Charlesworth, who says uh, each country, I assume, will have its own path to zero carbon. Um, and when ours, the UK, seems to be based on um, on uh, wind uh, and uh, derivatives of solar. But life is still about transport and heating and power generation, not necessarily in the hands of the UK government. Uh, where do you see the main stalling points? I think that heat is a problem. And, and heat is never sort of, it's always heating the, houses in particular. Heating houses, yes. Yeah. Uh, a third of our emissions are from heating houses. And it's in, incredibly important that we do address that. There's a lot of talk about um, hydrogen and trying to blend hydrogen as a starter into the existing gas pipes and move from there. And actually, there's a trial going on of a town in the, in, I think, in the northwest to try to make sure we can demonstrate how to do it. I think there's a growing awareness about heat that there wasn't really five or six years ago. And as I say, technology and um, innovation has moved quite a long way ahead so that people aren't talking as glibly now as it being impossible because you'd have to change all the pipes. That's no longer the case. We think we can get boilers hydrogen ready. We think we can uh, work with the pipes that we've got. So there's a lot of, of advance there. But um, your question is right. It's not just about um, electricity. It's also about heating houses um, to, mm -hmm. to, address, to address reducing carbon emissions. I mean, I don't want to soft soap it. The ambitions of the UK to get to net zero by 2050 are still huge. And there are some really big changes that need to take place to deliver that. Um, and I would say that heating houses is probably one of the most ambitious because people are very um, defensive of their houses. Uh, you know, I bear the scars of the Green Deal that uh, was introduced under the Cameron government when we couldn't get people to make the changes to their houses because they basically resisted the idea of having improvements made and then for having the costs. So, and I don't think the, the government's current version of the Green Deal is going terribly well. It's um, it's not straightforward to get involved in people's houses to improve their heating unless you actually pay for it and make it very simple. I mean, mm -hmm. even smart meters have not gone as well. I mean, they're fantastic smart meters. They really help people reduce the amount of electricity they use in their houses. But people can be very resistant to having them put into their own homes. Mm. Um, again, a whole other subject in there and why why uh, why government didn't um, do it through an app and uh, on people's phones and and, uh, and so on. Uh, hindsight is, is, is a great thing. But let me ask you this. Is one of the challenges that people offer in, uh, bring up and particularly when you start talking about very difficult things like heating and say um, all right the sound of net zero is great uh, the target of, of zero emissions but aren't we going to get really um, most of the benefit uh, even if we aim at 80 or 90 percent of that and it's the last 10 or 20 percent that is going to be incredibly expensive and disruptive and is, is the target too absolute? Um, I think that it's it's such a climate emergency that it would be irresponsible not to set an ambitious target for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, either you think this is a climate emergency and try to be ambitious in our response mm -hmm. or you don't. And it, it's also, I think, a good way of addressing a problem. To, uh, and so if you, if, you, if you fail in the last few percentage points. It's disappointing. It's not a disaster. But where are those last few percentage points? You want to set them as high as possible in the bar. As with when we deliver broadband, there's always a few places that don't seem to quite get it. But we have to set it as ambitiously as possible, because even though there are many plus sides to addressing climate change, the scale of the investment, the advantages that people can have in having much more technology to run their businesses, their lives, at the core of it, there is a real problem and we are seeing it. We are seeing it with rising seawater levels, with uh, people having to leave their homes. We will see it with further catastrophes over the over this century if we don't take action. And I think that we mustn't lose sight of that, that it's not a nice to have. It's an absolute imperative to do something about. Mm. 
Uh, personally, very, very much agree. This is, as I said, a standard challenge to these um, to these things. Let me uh, let me ask you one from Alastair, which dips into our next session on engaging the public and so on. But I think we'd love your views on this at this point. And he's asking, how do we mobilise the public and use engagement as a tool uh, to capitalise on, on on the COP and to encourage behaviour change on a, on a big scale? Yeah, I, I, I am being pleasantly surprised that I think the public are get, getting increasingly mobilised. Um, I mean, people ask me about it the whole time. As a former member of parliament, it became over the nearly 10 years that I was an MP, an escalating issue with people coming to want to talk to me about it. So the trajectory is going up in terms of people's engagement. I think that there's always more we can do. And I quite I liked the climate change assembly which I think you were involved with. I think that the more of those we can have, mm. the better. I think there's a distinct um, age differential. Young people are completely engaged in it, um, uh, less so as people get older. But I think the more we can do to engage them, the better. I think the government's been good at that, has been leading with it. The Boris Johnson's made it absolutely central to what he's trying to achieve as prime minister. And I think that um, MPs themselves are all now trying to show their engagement and their commitment. One another sort of good thing about the UK is that there isn't a political divide on this. Um, certainly, some parties want to go faster than others, but the 2008 Climate Change Act, which underpins all this, was agreed by both parties. And, and Bronwyn, you kindly said that I was the first Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change for the Conservatives, also the last, as it was closed by mm may and folded into bays. But I think that it's now perceived as being uh, such an important issue that, for instance, Alok Sharma has been given separate unit, separate group to run out of the cabinet office. And I see that he's also going to be doing all questions in the House of Commons um, in order to be able to address MPs concerns so they can take their questions back to their constituencies and show their engagement. So I think it's growing. I think the climate change assemblies are good. And I think that with the newspapers like the Mail, um, the Sun and the Express coming out saying, what are you doing about it? It's only going to continue to grow. Mm. Thanks. We've got one from Hannah Pierce saying, um, do you, Amber, Rod, believe that Alok Sharma can do a Laurent Fabius if the UK government fails to prevent the new coal mine in Cumbria from going ahead? Uh, I think the new coal mine in Cumbria is a mistake. Um, mm. I've had explained to me umpteen times by helpful um, supporters of it that, um, you know, this is coking coal for steel, otherwise we would have to import it. I understand all that, but it also involves exporting 85% of what it produced, coking coal. And I think that is the wrong thing for a country that wants to provide leadership to be doing. So I read today in the newspapers that uh, Cumbria is reconsidering it. I hope they reconsider it successfully <laughs> and that they make alternative arrangements to provide the coking coal temporarily for steel, because ultimately we want to live in a world where the steel industry as well has found alternatives. Heavy industries are going to be a really difficult mm. to crack, but there are a lot of people working on it. The buyers of steel have got together to say that they're going to put together a plan to make sure that the steel that they buy has reduced carbon emissions. We will get that at some stage. But at the moment, I agree with the questioner or what's implied from your questioner. No, I think it's important that it doesn't go ahead. Thanks for that. We've got one from Adele Benson saying, where will the responsibility for delivering net zero lie in government? At present, there are no departments that are solely tasked with climate sustainability, suggesting that this preparation for COP26 is rather superficial, just picking up on the point that you, you made a moment ago. Um, it is, it is a cross-cutting issue, isn't it, climate change and how we address it. So we know that Gordon, Gordon Brown made it into a separate department with um, Ed Miliband uh, addressing energy and climate change. And then it was folded in by Theresa May into Bayes because it was perceived that the biggest impact on these carbon emission reductions were going to be businesses. Certain businesses were complaining about the high cost of energy, were making them uncompetitive. How do you make a cross-cutting issue uh, work as an independent department or make it a priority for a prime minister. So I would say the fact that Boris Johnson has made it a priority is really important. I mean, it, it, it's the most important thing that a prime mm. minister has said, this is what we're going to achieve. I own this and I want to make sure I deliver it. After that, 
fair question who actually owns the delivery of that. I think you've got Kwasi Kwarteng tomorrow morning. I would say he he is delivering for the UK. Alloc has his own department within cabinet in the COP unit. And as I say, is answering questions at the House of Commons in a couple of weeks time. But he's not responsible for UK delivery. He's responsible for the international effort this year to host successfully COP26. So I would say it sits in bays and there's a reasonable debate about whether we should go back to spinning it out and having it as an energy and climate change department with cross-cutting influence across different departments. But just, just to comment on my experience as a uh, Secretary of State in three different departments under three different prime ministers, the status of an individual department matters enormously for whether you can influence other departments to take seriously your priority. The trouble with the energy and climate change department is that it was quite far down the pecking order what you'd want to do potentially is say we've got four great offices of state let's have five invest energy and climate change with the uh, authority of a great office of state give it to a really senior cabinet minister and then you'll see it delivered effectively thanks um, we'll see what we'll see what happens with that <laughs> the ifg has, has taken note uh, we might come back to some of those points about how it's handled in government because there are quite a few questions but let me take one from nick gowing um on, on business and he says uh there remains a huge number of corporate waverers who believe they have far more important existential issues to address what's the pivotal simple argument that will convince them how vital it is for them and us that they commit to being in for net zero by November. The cheerleading I think, kind of question. I think I think I would say to them, it's in your interest. It's in your interest because that's what investors want, that's what your employees want, and that's how your listing is going to move in terms of its uh, regulation. Everything is moving towards needing all investors and companies to follow the certain set of rules. And I don't think, I think that the net is closing in on the companies that want to avoid it. I mean, there's always going to be outliers who are going to try to avoid that, but there's so much movement towards people wanting this to take place that I think that if you get a reputation, for instance, you think back to some of the rows about people, big companies that weren't paying their taxes. If you get a reputation, uh, people aren't going to go and queue up for your coffee. People aren't going to want to go and buy your product if they think that you're the ones who are avoiding the really necessary actions to reduce carbon emissions. So I would say to that company, you need to do this thing because it's in your interest. It's in your interest because you need to maintain your reputation and it's in your interest because your investors need this from you. But the final thing is too, is there's always going to be pressure on getting good employees. Employees want this now. I talked talk to a friend of mine who's a chief executive at a bank. He did a survey to find out what it was that his new employees most appreciated about the company. They really appreciated the removal of the plastic straws. Sure. So, you know, people really mind about this. The culture of their own company matters because it affects their own view of themselves. So uh, I would say to the uh, to the company, you need to make these changes to get with it or you'll get left behind. Mm. Thanks for that. But an interesting one from Kevin Longford, um, Langford, sorry. Um, he says, look, we're not going to go to war to enforce a net zero commitment, for example, one made, made at the COP. But should we agree now a future regime of tariff sanctions to enforce commitments? And this, this, this really speaks to um, something that many people that, you know, what if some countries simply don't don't do it? Yes. I mean, I think that um, some sort of regime of border adjustment taxes um, or well, you know, ultimately the price on carbon is exactly what we need to try to achieve. And I know that that's on the agenda for COP this year. And, you know, rather than having tariffs, if you don't meet the agreements, I would try to have some sort of price on carbon for imports. I mean, having I've got the scars on my back from having tried to have discussions with certain members of parliament who thought that it was all um, rubbish, uh, are the sort of our targets for reducing carbon emissions, because we were importing so much from China with carbon in it. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 quite there is an element of truth in it. So I know that the government is looking at 
whether we can have some form of carbon adjustment taxes and whether this is something that we can try to make as part of COP this year. Obviously, Bronwyn and um, yeah, the participants will be aware that um, that leads straight to accusations of protectionism if you don't have additional uh, support for countries that would otherwise uh, potentially have trouble with that. So everything in COP is kind of linked to how you support other countries that are at different levels of um, industrialization and carbon emissions, but some sort of price on carbon, which was in Paris but hasn't really been achieved, is, is part of the success that we hope to, to achieve. We've really, as I said, got quite a few on this question of, of understanding of climate change within uh, the government. And we've one from um, David Lowry, uh, uh, Dr. David Lowry, who's really speaking for quite a few questioners here, who says, why has the, the government changed the minister responsible for delivering energy policy so often? And does this regular change of minister undermine the continuity of policy delivery? Can Alex Sharma have sufficient clout in cabinet without a department? Uh, I know he is technically embedded in the cabinet office, um, but without a, a department behind him to secure cabinet buy-in for the COP26 delivery. But the, the, the most important person who's committed to making a success of COP is Boris Johnson. And he, he wants it, I think, because of the climate change commitments already made. But it absolutely politically is essential for him as a convener of the big event and to show that the UK on the world stage. So in terms of buy in from cabinet, it's there already because Boris is completely behind it. In terms of Alok Sharma as leading on this, it's such a complicated deal. It's so difficult to travel, obviously, because of um, the virus. I think it's essential that Alok Sharma is on this and on this only. And yes, I think he can make a great success of this. He has the prime minister's ear. He's been base, he's been running base, so he knows what the difficulties are. And I know that he has a strong personal commitment to it. So I think it is the right structure that we've got. I, I do share um, your questioner's view about the amount of times junior ministers change. It's a failing of many governments and it's uh, it, it's a problem. It's a problem with our system. And I would much rather we had, having experienced it myself, people promoted to Secretary of State who've been junior ministers before, then they know what's going on much more. But, but yeah. Alok has been through this, so I think, yes, he yeah. can make a success. Yes, uh, it's a point there the IFG makes a lot. Yes. Uh, yeah, about absolutely. The, uh, the, these are technical you know, and detailed subjects. You just cannot take it on uh, entirely over, overnight. It's a well-made uh, point. It takes you a year. I mean, I was junior energy minister, thank yeah. goodness, for a year before I became energy secretary. And that helped enormously. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. OK, we've got one from Natalie Bennett. Um, again, in a sceptical thing, saying yesterday saw a Bayes off official say that UK government needs before COP to have in place a heat and building strategy, transport decarbonisation plan, uh, uh, treasury net zero review, tree strategy, hydrogen strategy, industrial decarbonisation strategy and nature strategy. Uh, is it really competent enough to do that? Well, of I hope so. I mean, I would agree. Let, let, let's look on the plus side. The fact that a Bayes official is saying that is saying at least it's coming from the inside that these things need to be done. Mm. Um, all those things need to be done. I mean, uh, I, I hope it can be done this year. But what I, I would say is that nobody in government is saying we mustn't do this. Everybody in government is saying these are essential things to do. We need to show the leadership. We need to get this done for the end of this year. Um, I think we have to just acknowledge that Treasury, for instance, that is you know, the core of a lot of these, because there's so often a short term cost to them, even if, if there might not be a long term cost, um, has got quite a lot on its plate. Um, you know, it just it's just got a lot going on with scale of the debt, the scale of the unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. So, Natalie, there's a lot to be done, but I certainly am right behind the government trying to make sure they do it. Thanks. But one from David Calvert, who says, um, can carbon offsets really be the mechanism to address the UK's last difficult emissions reductions when we approach 2050? How will we cor correct the problems of leakage and additionality? I certainly think that carbon offsets have got to be part of it. Um, and there's a lot of work going on into some sort of uh, voluntary programme that people can participate or companies can participate in. Um, I mean, of course, in an ideal world, we all live our lives and companies and governments live their 
policies and plans without the need for carbon offsets, but it's better than not having them in the short term now. So I, I think that carbon offsets should play a role. I think it's going to be very tricky to make sure that they are honest and that people are kept honest with, with them so that we can see clearly what they are. And that's another theme that comes we come back to is that there's so much going on in this sector that things like carbon offsets have got to have really transparent backing to what they're proposing at every stage. Thanks. And I could take one or two here that really take us into the subject of the next session on how to get the public um, involved in backing this. Um, but again, I think we'd very much like your, your views on them right now. One from David Deary, who puts it well and says, um, uh, the sixth carbon budget by the Climate Change Committee said that nearly 60% of the road to net zero would involve citizens having to actively take part in, in carbon reductions, whereas to date citizens have had to do nothing, as he puts it, uh, as it's all gone on in the background without them really having to, to make sacrifices that they're, they're conscious of. Um, how do you see citizens engaging in, in what he calls the sacrifice agenda? Well, I do think that citizens' assemblies uh, play could play an important part. And I think it's about trying to make sure that we have those sort of um, uh, round, not round tables, those sort of that sort of engagement, which is encouraging and participatory so that people can direct their uh, their enthusiasm for doing something mm -hmm. um, into action. Because here's the thing I do. Uh, my, my experience as an MP and subsequently talking to people, engaging with people on this subject is that citizens do want to do something. People who don't have a role in a country a policy or government still want to know how can I help? And I don't think we'd be very good at sharing that with them. So I think that if we went ahead with some citizens assemblies and we gave more tools perhaps to local councillors, to, uh, to, to local governments so that they can do things much more locally with people, we would motivate them. Because in my experience, they are already motivated. They just don't have a sense of direction on it. And if we can do that, we can help to capture that. I mean, there are also, of course, other technical ways. I've been talking to people who've been talking about uh, creating uh, carbon offset personal apps. There are things that citizens can do online. They can start to make sure that their pensions, for instance, are invested in really companies that are really committed to high levels of carbon emission reductions. There are all sorts of activities that they can take now that um, many are that I think we can highlight more effectively so that they can feel part of the change. So how would you see citizens assemblies working in this? Would they be directed towards local solutions and local local changes in behaviour or, or ways of testing what people might be asked to uh, contribute or sacrifice in the words of, the, of this question, what people nationally might be asked to do? How, how do you, we often find citizens assemblies come up in conversation, but actually what, what would that look like? I would, I would like to see them doing much more locally because that's I think what motivates people because otherwise you talk to a you know, I, you know as I say as a former MP you talk to a lot of people uh, locally about what they would like to do to contribute and they are um, sometimes a bit cynical about uh, uh, national governments and about policies that impact on them they can't really see but m seeing things happening locally much more relevant to them in terms of perhaps public transport, how the council spends the money, how they can get more engaged on um, local um, energy efficiency or uh, renewable energy on schools, that sort of thing, I think is much more real for people. So I would have them as a sort of local tool to try and impact on local communities. Then people would feel much more engaged. And we've got one from Eve Alcock. Um, in a slightly different direction. Um, an interesting point, how can we ensure that clean air is integrated effectively into net zero plans, given that, when she puts it, many climate friendly solutions exacerbate air pollution and therefore damage people's health? And she mentions diesel there, but I guess during the coronavirus as well, people might mention that the traffic diversion intended to make cycling um, and, and walking easier, but which has made, it led to worse air, uh, air pollution in some streets. Yes, um, I mean, diesel, I, diesel, she says, is a very is a very good example of that. Diesel it, is it's encouraged diesel. by the, gov the government. Yeah, diesel was a good example, but diesel was wrong. I mean, you know, and, and there are reasons for that, which we all we all now know about. Uh, I mean, it was it was it was you know misjudged in terms of its effectiveness 
for re reducing uh, emissions and we were lied to for a lot of it but I do think that clean air is at the uh, clean air is at the start really. Oh, sorry it just we were lied to just to spell out by whom then? By, by, by the German company that um, did the emission uh, testing. Yeah. So, I mean, diesel was 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 oh, all right. Uh, didn't re didn't remove as as many uh, carbon emissions as 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 expected, and then released many more particulates. Um, yes. And people had appreciated at the time yeah, when, when they recommended they buying, that. Change. People thought they were buying diesel to do the right thing, and it turned out to do exactly the opposite. But I think that clean air is absolutely at the start of why people uh, began to get involved in um, carbon emission reduction. And you look at somewhere like India, where clean air has been absolutely central to whatever to what they're trying to do to, to, to serve their population and reduce carbon emissions. I think it's a fair point. I think that generally clean air is served by having more renewable energy. I mean, one of the great things of the um, uh, of the virus, generally for most people, apart from occasional streets as, as set out, has been much cleaner air over the past few months. And we've got one um, on whether, as an island, um, we ought to be making more use of waves. Ah, um, if only we could. I mean, there have been all sorts of attempts to do so: tides, waves, underwater. Um, I long for one of them to become effective and be able to deliver uh, reliable electricity. But at the moment, we haven't been able to do so. There have been a number of tidal projects, but none of them have been secu have secured funding in order to progress. And, and it, it's interesting that people have talked about tidal and waves as a source of energy for a long time. And there have been a, a, a number of attempts to try to harness it none of them really successful but as an island we are blessed with a lot of wind and the wind is really where our success story lies in renewable energy and then let me take finally one from tim but several other people and it goes to what many people think is is, is the core of trying to get change and that that's the cost of it falling on individual households uh, and particularly those who can't uh, afford it whether their their heating costs are going to go up um or their, their vehicle costs, the things that they need for, for daily life. And we know how controversial uh, and politically um, explosive the question of energy charges and heating charges have been in the past. And when people hear all this stuff, should they be hearing, look, your heating bill is going to have to go up for green reasons? No, I really don't think they should. Um, I mean, I, 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 at the moment, in some countries, not in this country at the moment, but in some countries, the price of electricity from solar is cheaper than from hydrocarbons. There is so much progress in renewable energy that the prices have come right down. There are some upfront costs, there are, but I think that we have to make sure that we manage the electricity bills so that the costs of those are progressive. Government went some way to addressing that, not enough. I think that if there are going to be some big upfront cost costs, then I think we have to do it in a way that doesn't increase the costs on the lowest paid. But ultimately, in many respects, we're able to show already that some of these costs are already coming in at lower costs than traditional hydrocarbons. OK, great. I'm going to squeeze in one more. Uh, one from Andrew Jones saying the NHS is the largest institution in the UK. What incentives does the government need to offer to the NHS organisations and their suppliers to achieve their net zero goals? Well, I think it's the same as, as any business. Uh, the NHS needs to do uh, the right thing in order to support all its stakeholders to make sure that it's actually reducing its carbon emissions. I mean, it's about net zero everybody in. The NHS cannot be left out of this and it, it has to be a priority for them as well as this for everybody else. But coming back to some of the other questions I've had earlier, Bronwyn, is that all these things are urgent and important, but there's only so much bandwidth. So we have to we have to allow. I mean, the NHS has got enough on its plate trying to keep people alive for now. So I wouldn't go up to them and make this a priority right now, but I would perhaps later in the year. 
Thank you for that. Well, look, there's a lot of terrific other questions, um, uh, which I couldn't get in, and real apologies for that. A lot, uh, though, as I said, also relating to our next panel, which is going to start at 10.45, and do join us uh, for that. And that's on uh, getting the public on board with all this. And we have with us then Darren Jones, MP, who's chair of the House of Commons Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Select Committee, Chris Stark, who's chief executive of the Climate Change Committee, Rebecca Willis, professor in practice at Lancaster University, and um, and uh, Diamond uh, Tawney, who's an associate professor at Dublin City University and an expert advisor for the Irish Citizens Assembly on climate change. So do join us for that. But but at this point, we are going to have to wrap up. And so um, thank you all for joining. And can you um, join me virtually, if you like, in uh, in, in thanking Amber Rudd for um, her opening remarks, her optimism. Are her trenchant points on how the government should get there and the huge range of questions that she answered. Amber, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.